held on the honor, on the occasion of the honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, getting together to get to know more and more his, uh, his characters, alayhi salatu wa salam. If time will be helping us, we're going to review with you the investigations of the Roman emperor about who is that person that sent a message to the emperor of Rome asking him to become Muslim. But let us first try to review with you some of the characters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The characters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are hundreds of volumes of books that explored the characters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's not enough to explore his beautiful characteristics in two or three or four sessions. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed his characters in small words. Certainly, you have achieved the highest grade of morality, the highest standard of morality. And when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she also breathed it in two, three words. His morality was the Quran itself. She breathed it radiallahu anha. He was described in many descriptions, alayhi salatu wa salam. كَانَ أَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ وَجْهًا The best people in, in face. He was the best in morality. He used not to be too long, nor too short, but between. مَرْبُوعًا مَرْبُوعَ الْوَجْهِ يعني, um, His face is circled. Uh, between his two shoulders, there's a wideness. He used to be having a wide shoulders. Kathal um, Lihya, long beard. And they used to recognize his recitation of the Quran through the moving of his beard. He has a ready part on his face white and some parts of his face. Red. His head is huge, hands and feet are huge. White face, circled. When he used to be smiling, when he is happy, you can see his face as, it, as if it is a piece of gold. A piece of gold. He used not to laugh too much, except smiling. Except smiling. <clears throat> but sometimes he was described to be laughing until his two teeth here are shown. He is not to be laughing just like the way people laugh today. He used to say after every salah, when he says assalamu alaikum, this is authentic, Bukhari and Muslim and many others, narrated by Az Zubair bin Awam, that they saw him right after he said assalamu alaikum, he said, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la, lahu al mulk wa lahu al hamdu wa ala kulli shayin qadir, la ilaha illallah, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al aliyya al azim, wa la na'abudu illa iyyah wa khlasina lahu al deena wa lahu karaha al kafirun. Uh, وَلَا نَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّهِ لَهُ النِّعْمَةِ وَلَهُ الْفَضْلِ وَلَهُ الثَّنَاءُ الْحَسَنِ 
لا اله الا الله مخلصين له الدين ولو كره الكافرون اللهم لا مانع لما اعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد right after he finishes from taslim unlike some people I don't know how do they understand it. They start instantly by making takbir. That had not been detected from the action of the Prophet <coughs> No. This is what had been defined. Right after he finishes Tasneem, he used to be saying these, uh, these things. He used to be very soft, even with his family. The moment he enters والسلام, his house, the first thing he begins with, what is it? What is the first thing he begins with? Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Okay. Before Assalam, maybe. Even, maybe even before Assalam. Siwak. He used to begin with Siwak. Today, the husband, despite his bad morality in the house, Despite his uh, angry face, his wife must come to him and kisses him, no matter what, even if he's smelling. You know? <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ, who doesn't wish among his family to kiss him, even if he has a bad smell? Who? Who would say no? Despite that, he was ﷺ, so careful, he was so sen sensitive. He was so sensitive. You know, there's a long story about Aisha and Hafsa. They became in two groups. The wives of the Prophet became into two groups. Aisha and Hafsa and Sauda, they agreed to plot to make a plan. Women are women. She said, we're gonna trick him. Zainab used to be having a very significant kind of honey. And the Prophet loved it. And he used to pass by Zainab in order to take that honey. So Aisha said, Let's trick, let, let's make a trick against him. Sauda, she said, I was about, she said, look, you're putting me in trouble. I'm about to say that to the Prophet Then Aisha said to her, Skuti, be quiet, don't say it. So, as the Prophet entered to the house of Aisha, she said, do I smell maghafir? He said, no, but Zainab gave me honey. She said, mm, uh, maybe that honey was passing by smelly kind of trees. That's why this honey is, seemed to be smelly. She said, I'm not, the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm not going to return to that honey anymore. And he made it haram on himself. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah, Ya ayyuhal nabiyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. O oh Prophet, why do you make haram on yourself what, what Allah had made halal for you? To the extent that when he realized that there might be a smell that comes out of his mouth, even because of this honey, he said, Khalas, I'm not going to return to it. Subhanallah. Jarasat Nahluhul Urfuta, that's what Aisha said. She said, those uh, bees had passed by uh, a smelly kind of trees. That's why the honey itself is smelly. Subhanallah. So when he enters the house also, after he says, Salaam Alaikum, Taman. As the brother said, he used to say, Assalamu Alaikum. Naam. Not only Assalamu Alaikum. No. He used to say like this, Assalamu Alaikum Ahl al Bayt. That's narrated in Bukhari. I had a debate with the Shia, and he said, he mentioned Assalamu Alaikum only. And I said, no. You cut it. You are mudallis. You cut the text. The Prophet used to say to Aisha, Assalamu alaikum ahl al bayt. Not only this, Aisha said, and when he used to pass by all the other wives of the Prophet, because during the whole day he passes by his wives, saying to each one of them, Assalamu alaikum ahl al bayt. 
So who, who are Ahlul Bayt now? The wives and the children and the sons of the Prophet ﷺ, not only the wives. But the Shia, no. When they, when they acknowledge the sons of the Prophet to be his Ahlul Bayt, they deny his wives to be Ahlul Bayt. Can't be. Because who stay in the house of the Prophet? His wives. So those who live in the house, they deserve to be called Ahlul Bayt. Do you know that the Prophet said, as sinawru min Ahlul Bayt? The cat is of Ahlul Bayt. Because it, it keeps hanging around the house always. Even the cat. It's been narrated in Sahih Muslim. That uh, companion said, we used to be considering Abdullah ibn Mas'ud among Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah. Why? Because he used to be always sticking to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Staying with him because of his extreme stay in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, they said we used to be calling Abdullah ibn Mas'ud one of the people of Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah. So when he enters the house, what he used to be starting with after saying Assalamu Alaikum, is there food? Then they say, No, Wallahi, there's nothing. Imagine if this happens to you. What are you supposed to be doing? What made you busy? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? To the extent, really, it happens with us that, I mean, uh, I don't know, that a wife says, I wish he goes to work. And if he comes, she says, why did he come? Are you better than Rasulullah? And the Prophet, ﷺ, he was addressed by Allah saying this to him. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظًا الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ First he said, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ what, what a mercy that you have shown to them, to your companions. And if you were blunt, hard-headed, or, or uh, uh, how do you say it? Hard-hearted, they would have fled away from you and left you. So what he used to say when he asked about food, and his wife say, we have no food. He used to say, then I am fasting. Inni idan sa'i. And now we can, we can know that if a person did not make intention for any voluntary kind of uh, fasting, for example, the day, yani half of the day passed already, or even more, and the Prophet did not eat anything or drink anything, or any one of us, I mean, then we decide to keep on fasting, it is allowed. <coughs> Except what? The obligatory fasting. Especially the first day of Ramadan. The first day of Ramadan, if you did not prepare intention, that means the day began, the sun rise, and you did not know before Fajr that this day is Ramadan, then you have to make another fasting after Ramadan finishes. This is especially for the first day of Ramadan. Other than that, than that there's automatic kind of intention at this, from the second day of Ramadan and on. طيب. <clears throat> He used to be very humble, alayhi salatu wasalam. No one was more ever beloved to the companions more than the Prophet sallallahu Even despite that, they used not to stand up when he comes a cause of what they know of his hatred to this. Did you understand that? He used to be hating that someone stand up for him. Unlike today, if the teacher comes, they all stand up. There are difficult things now as to how to, how to deal with them. But the Prophet is the most person that people give respect. And despite that, he used to be hating 
that someone stand up for him. <clears throat> he used to be walking. Whenever he walks, the companions do not walk behind him, but they walk in front of him. Why? Protection. Protection. Okay, what else? No. They used to leave his back for the angels. The angels used to be behind him. So no one walks behind the Prophet ﷺ. They leave his back to the angels. And this is authentic. He used to be, when he hates something, companion said, we used to know it by his face. We can see it, we can read on his face that he hates something. He used to be sleeping. And when he wakes up, he pray and he doesn't perform wudu. Is that correct? Yes. Why? Uh, because he knew about inside of his body while even he sleeping. I think I mentioned that before, right? Yeah. 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 His eyes sleep, but the heart doesn't. The heart should be always available for the revelation. Ready. Awakened. Not necessarily to be, to, to be awakened about what happened in the surrounding. No. No, no, about himself only. Because one day, the Prophet ﷺ, he was tired, and the companions were tired, they slept, and he, saw, and he said, to be, he, he said, who's going to be guarding us for Salat al-Fajr tonight? Bilal said, me, O Rasulullah. Then all of them, including Bilal, they kept sleeping until they were hit by the heat of the sun. Even Rasulullah ﷺ. Then after the Prophet woke up, he said, Ya Bilal, ma hadha? Where is your promise, Bilal? He said, Ya Rasulullah, there is no kind of sleep ever heavier that occurred to me except this, this sleeping at this night. It was the heaviest, Ya Rasulullah. Then, th because this may be a doubt, you know, a doubtful thing that, okay, the Prophet is awake, but what about this? So the, com the commentators of the hadith said that the Prophet is awakened about what occurs with him. That he doesn't, he knows if he lost wudu or not. So that's why we have in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet, he sleeps. وَكَانَ إِذَا نَامَ نَفَخْ Nafakh like this, if he sleep, he used to go like that. Nafakh. فَإِذَا قَامَ صَلَّى وَلَمْ يَتَوَضَّى So as he wakes up, he prays without, without performing wudu. So now it's clear, inshallah. Now. <coughs> وَكَانَ يَسْتَوْصِي بِالنِّسَاءِ خَيْرًا He used to be يعني, uh, advise, uh, advising people, approaching men about being good to their wives, to all women. People used not to be pushed away. Get back, get back. No, no, no. That was, that was not what the Prophet ﷺ. Here um, in our uh, life, yes. With our leaders, yes. But not with the Prophet ﷺ. And I wonder, subhanAllah, each one of the companions, if he has any problem, he goes and complains to the Prophet ﷺ. That means his door is always open. He was available. To the extent that Umar radiallahu anhu, when Asma bint Umais visited his daughter, Hafsa. So Umar entered the house of his daughter and said, uh, who's that woman? She said, uh, Asma. He said, who's Asma? She said, Asma bint Umais. He said, Ah, Al Bahriya to Hadi, Al Habashiya to Hadi. He said, Oh, this uh, woman of the sea, this Ethiopian woman, they used to be calling those who migrated to Ethiopia companions. They used to call them Ethiopians, Habashiya. Then Asma heard him. Then he said to Asma, 
نحن سبقناكم بالهجرة مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نحن أولى منكم برسول الله We preceded you by the hijrah with the Prophet وسلم, with the Prophet وسلم. We are more deserving to be closer to the Prophet than you Asma bint Umayyis got angry and she said لا والله كنا في أرض البعداء والبغضاء We used to be living with the land of the enemies and the hateful people وكنتم مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعظ جاهلكم ويطعم جائعكم And you used to be with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم feeding the hungry one among you and advising those ignorance among you. She was angry because he, what he said to her. And wallahi, I'm going to go to the Prophet وسلم, and can't complain to him about what you said. Even in the secondary matters, they used to go to him. His door is always available. Always. Subhanallah al -Azim. Then she went to the Prophet and she she, she mentioned to him exactly what he said to her and exactly what she said to him. Then the Prophet said, you, uh, they are not more deserving than you. You have two hijras. Your migration to Ethiopia and your migration to Medina after that. So the Prophet did not approve what Umar said. Unlike the Shia claiming that the Pro Umar may dictate something on the Prophet and the Prophet accepted. As if he's forced, yani. who told you? No one ever forced the Prophet The Prophet Muhammad conquered the mountain, the, the worst kind of uh, stubborn, hard-headed people. And Allah granted him victory against them. Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, Amr ibn Hisham, etc., etc. Allah granted him victory. There's no one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wallahu ya'asimukum in nas and Allah will be protecting you, supporting you against people. How can you claim that Umar dictates on the Prophet something and the Prophet uh, has to compromise with him? That, that's a lie. We see here that the Prophet did not compromise with Umar. He said to Asma bin Tumais, No, you have better right. You are closer. You are more deserving to me because you have achieved two hijrah, not only one. كان يتوضأ مما مست النار. He used to be performing wudu from what the fire touched, like what you call today uh, uh, grill or barbecue. Yes, the Prophet used to be performing wudu from that. But Jabir رضي الله عنه said, كان آخر الأمرين من فعل رسول الله. ترك الوضوء مما مست النار. The the recent among the two actions of the Prophet ﷺ is to abandon performing wudu from what the fire touched. So it used to be obligatory before, but afterwards no. Finish. Obligated. كان يكره النوم قبل العشاء. He used to be hating the sleeping before عشاء. والحديث بعده. And to, you know, keep speaking after it. Dialogues, long speech. But privately, he used to be having a private speech, confidential, between him and Abu Bakr regarding the matter of the Ummah. No wonder that Abu Bakr became the most person of knowledge about the Prophet ﷺ. No. He used not to shake hands with women. Ah. He used not to shake hands with women. Wow. Do we do we fulfill this? We are in a in in an environment uh, very critical. Especially if 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 you meet with people who do not understand this. Sometimes your soul may say to you, let's bargain, it's okay. But be careful. 
Don't forget what Aisha was swearing by Allah about. She said, La wal la wallahi. La wa wallahi ma masat yadu rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yadam ra'atin la tahillu lahu qat. I swear by Allah that the Messenger of Allah never put his hand in the hand of a foreigner woman that is not allowed for him. Never. He used to be, whenever he stand at night for prayer, he used to be beginning with this dua. Allahumma anta nuru samawati wal ardi wa fihin. Allahumma lakal hamd anta nuru samawati wal ardi wa fihin. Wa lakal hamd anta maliku samawati wal ardi wa fihin. Wa lakal hamd anta qiyamu samawati wal ardi wa fihin. Wa lakal hamd anta al haq wa wa'aduka haq. أنت الحق وقولك الحق ووعدك حق ولقاءك حق والنار حق والجنة حق والساعة حق والنبيون حق اللهم اغفر لي ما قدمت وما أخرت وما أسرت وما أعلنت وما أنت أعلم به مني أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت وأنت على كل شيء قدير This is the dua that we, he used to be uh, saying and also there's another dua, Allahumma Rabba Jibreel wa Israfeel wa Mikael, Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard, Anta tahkum bayna ibadika yawm al-Qiyamati fi ma kanu fihi yakhtalifun. Alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Etc. Tayyip. When, whenever, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, I, I I forgot something. Yeah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I used to be giving this wasiya, afshi salam, abdil al-ta'am. واستحي من الله استحياءك استحياءك من رجل من أهلك. Spread the peace and strive to grant food and fear Allah. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Be shy of Allah, just like the shyness you feel from. A very respected member of your family. And if you did bad, do good. And uh, try to improve your morality as much as you can. He used to be having marvelous kind of wasiya. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said, Awsani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi sab'a. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, awsani, that means he uh, gave me, the, he uh, advised me. <sighs> With a beautiful advice. A beautiful advice. Amarani bi hubbi al masakini wa dunuwi minhum. He advised me to love the masakin. And to be close to them. And to be close to them. Hmm. Bye. وَأَمَرَنِي أَنْ أَنْظُرَ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ تَحْتِي وَأَنْ لَا أَنْظُرَ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ فَوْقِي And he ordered me to look at those who are beneath me, not those who are higher than me. That means in property, in money, etc. وأمرني أن أصل الرحمة وإن أدبرت. And he ordered me to keep maintaining the tie of kinship even if it flee if it flee away from me. يعني as it's fleeing away from me, I should detect it and trace it and follow it. وأمرني أن لا أسأل الناس شيئا. وأمرني وأمرني 
أن أقول الحق ولو على نفسي. And he ordered me to speak the truth even if it's against me. And he ordered me not to ask anyone anything. And he ordered me, I'll repeat the, the, the fifth one. And he ordered me to speak the truth even if it's against me. And he ordered me, أن أقول الحق وإن كان مرة. And he ordered me to speak the truth even if it's bitter. وأمرني أن أكثر من لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. And he ordered me to exceed saying لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Why? Oh, Rasulullah. Why, would you, why exceeding لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله? The Prophet said, فإنها كنز من تحت العرش. For it is treasure beneath the throne. Saying, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah is treasure beneath the throne. Can we remember these seven recommend, recommendations or commandments of the Prophet Sallallahu He ordered me to love masakeen and to be close to them. To look in respect and consideration to those who are beneath me, not to those who are greater, higher than me. Why? Because if you keep looking at those who are higher than you, you'll be belittling Allah's grace upon you. The third one, if you remember. وَأَمَرَنِي أَنْ أَصِلَ الرَّحِمَةِ وَأَنْ أَدْبَرَتْ The kinship. Fourth, and and la asala and nasa shayya, and he ordered me not to ask people anything. Not to ask people anything. Is it permissible? Yes and no. Yes, when you have to, you have no other way. No to exceed. I'm scratching my head now, right? Yeah. If you ask what you do not need, Allah will be converting your nails from being like, a, as if it's plastic now, to become a metal material or iron material. This nail at the Day of Judgment will be changed to, uh, how do you call it in English? Nuhas. Nuhas. Copper. Copper. Made of copper. You'll be scratching your face. The more you ask what you do not need here, the more you'll be scratching your face by your copper nails at the Day of Judgment. So if you want to exceed those scratchings at the Day of Judgment, go ahead, exceed asking what you do not need. Islam is a great balance. He orders you not to ask what you do not need. But at the same time, he ordered those people, rich, to search for the poor people. You know why? Because the masakeen at that time, they used to be pretending to be rich. Pretending that, alhamdulillah, I don't need anything. Why, they are in great need. But they're not zero. The difference between the poor and miskeen, faqir and miskeen, al faqir has nothing at all. More than. Miskeen, he has... He has something, but it's very little. He's still in a great need. The masakeen at the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ used to be pretending that they're rich, and alhamdulillah, they don't need. Some of the companions of Rasulullah ﷺ, muhajireen, they came to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, they said, Oh, Amr ibn Abdullah ibn Amr. Wallahi, we have nothing, not even to cover, to, to, to cover ourselves. We have nothing. We're very poor. He said, it's up to you. If you want, I can try to find something for you. If not, I'll speak to the Sultan for you. I'll write to the Sultan. Who is the Sultan? I need the, the leader. Or if you want, you can be patient. And I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying 
that uh, the poor of the Muhajireen, the poor people of the Muhajireen, will be entering paradise before the rich Muhajireen within, I don't know how many, 500 years. As they heard it, they said, no, we be patient and we're not going to ask. Khalas. They prefer to be, yeah, I need to be like this and not to ask. So see the great balance. To the extent that the rich have a problem now in searching for the poor. I know people, for example, um, generally in Saudi Arabia. At the night of Eid, they keep searching by themselves, going to the poor zones, detecting, trying to find those who are in need. So that will be, that will be motivating love between the rich and the poor. Unlike in the different societies, the poor hates the rich. And if you can find a way just to destroy him and to spoil what he has, he will do. Islam brought a love between the rich and the poor. They both love one another because of the beautiful system that Islam contains. Even Umar radiallahu anhu used to be eating with his servants, slaves. <clears throat> and he used to be criticizing those who feel that they are more exalted, higher than sitting down and eating with his slaves. He used to be supplicating Allah against those kinds of people. Subhanallah. <clears throat> no. And he used to be, not only this, he used to be supplicating Allah this, alayhi salatu wassalam. Allahumma ahyini miskinan, wa amitni miskinan, wa hshurni fi zumrat al masakin. Oh Allah, let me live with the miskin people, and die with the miskin kind of people, and gather me at the day of judgment with those miskin people. He used to love this. <laughs> People of the parliament, when there is any election, you can see them in the marketplaces. <clears throat> in market places, because it's voting season, it's a voting season, so they have to humble themselves at that time only. But you can see that their luxurious dress, faces, MashaAllah, the, the chin here is very, it's just like certain kinds of birds, very big like this, because of extreme eating. They look luxurious. People will be so happy, oh, this, this is, this, that's him. Yeah, uh, he's shaking hands with people. Why? He needs them now. He needs them. He has to show certain kind of uh, popularity and, and humbleness. After he gets his voting and finish, they have to, you know, there's, for these kinds of people, there's one season, not four seasons. Autumn, uh, winter, summer, spring. No, his season is only one. Uh, not only every year, every four years when he, when he needs to be elected. No. When not, I've seen rich people, you know, in different countries. They have luxurious cars and uh, they put uh, this shading, black shading. He doesn't want to see the poor people. He doesn't want to be bothered. And in Islam, wallahi, even you have the whole world in your hand. You must come to the masjid and pray with those people, even those workers, builders. You have to pray behind, beside them, side by side. You're not significant. In this, you're not significant. He used to be very soft in his dealing. A man came and he said to the Prophet O oh, Messenger of Allah, allow me to fornicate. You know the story. All of you know it? 
And the Prophet was dealing with him in a, in a very beautiful way. The companions thought that he is mocking or something, or he's hypocrite. But he was not. He was suffering something. And the Prophet said to him, do you accept it to be done for your daughter? He said, no. جَعَلَنِ اللَّهُ فِدَاك The man said, no, I don't allow it. May Allah ransom my soul for you. So how can he be a hypocrite when he says something like this? Then the Prophet said and replied, and people don't like it for their own daughters. Until the Prophet put his hand on his chest and supplicated Allah for him. Allahumma tahir qalba wa hassin farja. Oh Allah, purify his heart and purify his private part from falling in haram. Then the man said, Wallahi, after the hand of the Prophet touched my chest, it became to me the worst and the most hateful thing, or hated, hated thing, to think about fornication or something like this. Never ever after that. And you know the story of the, of the uh, Bedouin who entered the masjid, and in the midst of the masjid he decided to uh, urinate. And the Prophet ﷺ, his approach was so beautiful. And he said, ﷺ, you had not been sent to cause difficulties, but be muyassireen. We see, and yeah, make things easy, not to make things difficult on people. فَإِنَّمَا بُعَثْتُمْ مُيَسِّرِينَ وَلَمْ تُبْعَثُوا مُعَسِّرِينَ And this man, he saw the Prophet's beautiful, soft approach, and he said to him, this masjid is not for this, was not set for this kind of thing. And after that, this man went and performed wudu, took a corner in the masjid, and he raised his hands and said, Oh Allah, grant me mercy, me and Muhammad, and don't grant mercy to anyone else but me and Muhammad. The Prophet said, you have narrowed the wide mercy of Allah. You have narrowed the, mer the wide mercy of Allah. No. La ilaha illallah. Yeah. That's why Ali he used to be urging us to be humble, not to not to deal arrogantly. What was the difference between what was the difference between uh, Adam's sin and uh, Iblis' sin? Both sinned, right? Both were sin both were sinners. The sin of Adam is based on lust, while the sin of the devil was based on arrogance. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported Adam and taught him what are the words to repent and to return. Why he didn't support the devil? He didn't only enable he didn't only enable Adam to repent. No, no. But he even supported him. He taught him the words of repentance. What to say? Why? Because the sin based on arrogance is worst. Look what Allah said. سأصرف عن آياتي الذين يتكبرون في الأرض بغير الحق. I will swerve away from my signs those who are arrogantly behave apart from truth. وإن يروا كل آية لا يؤمنوا بها. But if they see any sign, they won't believe it. وإن يروا سبيل الرشد لا يتخذوه سبيلا. And if they see the way of rectitude, rushd, the way of righteousness, they don't take it away for themselves. وَإِنْ يَرَوْ سَبِيلَ الْغَيِّ يَتَّخِذُوهُ سَبِيلًا And if they see the way of evil, they will take it as a way for themselves. This is a punishment from Allah. 
make sure that you do not fall in arrogance. Not only this, Adam was told not to do, and he did. The devil was ordered to do, and he didn't. You have to, you have to recognize the difference between both. Adam did not disobey the order. He was told not to do. What is the, what is the difference between both? Mm. Deciding not to do what Allah said to you, do is worse than doing what Allah said, don't do. Especially if it's also based on arrogance, oof, that's far in error. That's worse. He used to be supplicating. I like sometimes that you take these supplications. They are very important. He used to be saying, Allahumma hadini li ahsan al-akhlaq. Oh Allah, guide me to the best of morality. La yahdi li ahsaniha illa an. No one, kind, no one can guide to the best of it except you. Wasrif anni sayyiha. And, and keep, protect me from the evil kind of morality. La yasrif anni sayyiha illa an. There is no one that swerved me away from that evil morality except you. And he says, Inna Allah awha ilayya an tawadu. Allah had inspired, revealed unto me that be humble hatta la yabghiya ahadun ala ahad to the extent that no one will be transgressing against the other. So if you are arrogant, sure you're going to be transgressing against others. Sure you're going to be. And he said, والسلام, there is no one that humbled himself for the sake of Allah. But Allah will be raise him, raising him in high grades at the Day of Judgment when you humble yourself. Have you seen those uh, leaders in wars? When they conquer their enemies, the leader of that campaign, how he enters after he conquers the enemy, like this, right? Mm. The Prophet ﷺ, when he entered Mecca, conquered its people, his chin was touching his chest, showing extreme humbleness and thankfulness to Allah for his support. And he sees, uh, and uh, acknowledging Allah's favor that this victory is from Allah, not by himself, not by his power. No commander, no leader, when he conquers the enemy, will be, will be entering like this, but he will be entering like that. Except the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Sufyan said, Ya Muhammad, uh, people are saying, people are saying, Khalas, we're gonna, we are going to annihilate those people of Mecca because there are, because you know, the companions, they want to retaliate. The Prophet was driven out, the Prophet was tortured. So, companions, they are waiting for that moment. But look at the, the, the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. The leader of the wars against Muhammad was Abu Sufyan. And when Abu Sufyan said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad, istubihat, istubihat Quraysh, khalas, Quraysh is going to be annihilated, khalas, going to be killed. No Quraysh after, to, after this day, oh Muhammad. Then the Prophet ﷺ Surprised the companions by saying, "Man dara Abi Sufyan amin." Whoever entered the house of Abu Sufyan is granted security. Allahu Akbar. Ten years Abu Sufyan was fighting the Prophet, and suddenly the Prophet says, "Whoever entered the house of this man, he is secured." And then. 
He said to them, you are a tulaqa. You are free from anything that may touch you. Khalas. This is the Prophet ﷺ. And the Shia today, they disgrace the companions whom the Prophet said, you are a tulaqa. They call, oh, those are a tulaqa. They are the... They are the pardoning of Rasulullah. This is honor for them. It should be an honor for them. It shouldn't be a disgrace against them. Allahu Akbar. He was described at the Fathul Akbar, the greatest day of victory, that when he entered, he bent his head like this down as an actress as an action of humbleness and humility to Allah. حتى إن رأسه لا يمس رحله من شدة تواضع. يعني his head was about even to touch the cattle, just like that, because of showing humbleness to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for this great day. He used to say عليكم عليه الصلاة والسلام. Khayrukum, the best among you, are those who are best to their own families. And I am the best among you toward my family. Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. Wa ana khayrukum li ahli. And I am the best among you regarding my family. And he used to say, alayhi salatu wasalam, akmalu al-mu'minina imanan ahasinuhum akhlaqa. Those who are with the most complete, the full Iman are those with full morality. That's why Ibn Qayyim says, Rahimahullah, Al-Khuluqu Imanun Kullu. The, the good morality is faith. So whoever was exceeded more than you in morality, that means he has more faith than you. Anyone has more morality than you, that means he has more faith than you. And we wonder if the kuffar have morality, and we can see that in different type of people. We say we should have, be more deserving for this morality. More than them, because the Prophet ﷺ said, among uh, the beloved one to me, among you, and the closest will be with me in paradise, are those among you who have good morality. So now it's up to you. If you want to be, yeah, we know for sure that you did not live with the Prophet in this life, and this is a big loss, yes, we, un we understand that this is a loss, right? Yeah, it is loss. But don't lose at the day of judgment to be close to the Prophet ﷺ by the lack of your morality. So it's up to you now, guys. You can improve, you have the choice. If you want to be closer to the Prophet tomorrow or not, it's easy. Improve your morality. You can do that. He said, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I have a mountain of gold, it, it, uh, uh, it won't be really pleasant to me to have three days a mountain of gold, except if I have something of it, Except for one reason, I'll be happy. What will be making the Prophet happy? To have money in his house? Only preparing to pay his debt. That means the Prophet is so happy. If he has any money, to pay back his debt. Do you feel happy when you have money and someone comes to you and says, uh-uh, pay, pay me back my money. How many among us, they say, uh, come next week, please. Uh, next month, inshallah. And he has. He has money to pay back. But he doesn't like to, this money to, subhanallah. Yani, he love money. A great kind of love. It used to be saying to me, what is, was, what is in your pocket you worth it. If you have one pound, you worth one pound. If you have no pound, you worth nothing. 
This is a, even they say to me, saying hello is not for free. <laughs> it's not for free. Even saying hello, it's not for free. This, these are the fruits <laughs> of the uh, bitter fruits, I mean. This is the bitter fruit of the materialistic world. In Islam, Rubba Rajulin Ash'ath or Rubba Ash'ath Aghbar. ذي طمرين لا يؤبه له مدفوع بالأبواب لو أقسم على الله لا أبره. It might be a person who is curly, dusty, pushed away by the doors. Get out. No one gives him any consideration. If this man himself, if he swear by Allah that Oh Allah, I swear by you that you do this for me, Allah will do that for him. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look in consideration about your image or your colors, but He looks in consideration to your hearts and your actions. This is Islam. In his house, he used to be very patient. Zainab radiallahu anha, a great woman, a very generous. I think I mentioned to you what the Prophet said before, that uh, the, the closest to me after my death, that means following me, among you, my wives, is the one with the longest hand. Did, you, did, did I mention that to you before? No? Mm. So after the Prophet's death, Aisha, Hafsa, Safiya, Sauda, all the, all the wives of the Prophet used to be measuring their hands. Whose hand is longer? Until Zainab died. When Zainab died, uh -uh, now we know what the Prophet meant by this. He meant by that, the most generous one among us. And Zainab used to be a woman of donating. Her hand was always open, donating. But once there's a problem happened with, between her and Aisha, there used to be you know, jealousy of women. We know it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was sitting and Zainab came to Aisha and she started to speak badly against her. Aisha and she said, I kept quiet looking at the Prophet and looking at her as if by her, by her looking, as if she's taking permission from the Prophet to reply. Then the Prophet said, reply, take your right. Then Aisha spoke one word or something, didn't say much. Then the Prophet said, mm -mm, she is the daughter of a Siddiq. She is the daughter of a Siddiq. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who is the most beloved one to you, O Rasulullah? He said, Abu Bakr. They said, no, uh, we meant uh, among your wives. He said, Aisha, his daughter. So the most beloved one to Rasulullah is Abu Bakr. Among women is Aisha. Then, who? But we know Omar and Uthman, etc. But this, the significant ones who used to be called the beloved one of Rasulullah. Um Ayman. Um Ayman. Uh, the wife of Zaid. She became the wife of Zaid. She's Ethiopian, by the way, Um Ayman. And Zaid used to be called Hibbu Rasulullah. Zaid, you know the story of Zaid was, um, what do you call those mercenaries? Uh, those who cut the way of travelers. You know, they used to be stopping a convoy and uh, rubbing them. So once that had been done, Zayd radiallahu anhu was taken and he was sold in Mecca. And when the Prophet married Khadija, Khadija bought him Zayd as a gift to the Prophet And Zayd, the father of Zayd was, was 
yani for many years looking for his son, tracing his son, trying to find where he is. And suddenly he was told that he's in Mecca. And the Prophet was not Prophet at that time. But he saw the marvelous morality of the Prophet ﷺ. Zaid, I mean Zaid. And as his father found him in Mecca, the father was so happy with the meeting of his son, and the son was so happy with the meeting of his father, then on the next day the father said to his son, okay Zaid, let's go. He said, where? He said, go with me, I'm your father. He said, sorry, I can't leave this man. He said, I'm your father. He said, yes, my father, I understand that. But this man, I cannot leave, no, there's no way. At least the father, he knows that his son is in safe, yeah, in safe situation. He said, okay, since you are in a, in a safe situation and everything is good with you, well, that's your decision. He left him. The Prophet wanted to show appreciation for the decision of Zaid. He went down to the center of Kaaba, the, of Mecca, which is Al Kaaba. And he made an announcement that Zaid is my son, he inherits me, and I inherit him. And they used to be call him the son of Muhammad. Afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited this. Uh, name them for the name that they belong to their fathers. It is more fair with Allah's perspective. But if you did not know their fathers, then they are your brothers in faith. They are your uh, slaves. And the Prophet prohibited calling someone Abdi, my slave, my servant. Slave is different than servant. But precisely, don't call your, your slave's servant. Say, uh, Fatai. Or if it's a concubine, Amati. But not Abdi. He didn't, he didn't like it, Ali Salatu Wasalam. One of his wives is Safiya, radiallahu anha. Do you know who's Safiya? Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. From, he is the leader of an Nadir Jewish tribe in Medina. Now, she's a Jew. And the Prophet ﷺ, oh, she was taken as uh, Jariya, you know, concubine, spoils of war. Duhya al Kalbi. She was given to Duhya al Kalbi. Duhya. Al Kalbi. Duhi Al Kalbi is to be the, the most handsome one in Medina among the companions of Rasulullah. Very handsome, Duhi Al Kalbi. To the extent that Jibreel used to be coming in the image, when you take the image of a human being, he used to be taking the image of Duhi Al Kalbi. So she was given to him. But Usaid ibn Hudayr, I think, came to the Prophet and said, Oh Rasulullah, Safiya bint Huyay is the daughter of the highest honorable people among the Jews. And the, she's the daughter of the head of the Jews, of those tribes. She doesn't deserve to be for anyone but you. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted this. And she was given to him. And he, uh, he gave her mahar. You know the mahar. Dowry, and he married her. What is her dowry? Hmm? What is her dowry? She's slave now. What, what was her dowry? Freeing her. Atqwa. Freeing her was her dowry. And he married her. Now look what she's saying here. She said, I haven't seen. She said, I haven't seen any one ever more in beautiful morality ever more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You know if she you know if she <laughs> if the Prophet was a liar, it wasn't a prophet, and this daughter, this woman is the daughter of the Jews, should be yani, keeping her uh, Jew, Jewish faith and trying to expose the Prophet. You know if she said that he is a liar, 
Nobody's going to be, be believing. His wives are exposing him. That's why when I said last time, he had the collection of 14 wives in different times, not at the same time. They all praised his beautiful, fabulous morality. And we know that those, Sani, every woman is a media in herself. Every woman is media. So if the Prophet had something, and those liars, they hide things. But those hidden things cannot be kept hidden by their wives. They'll be exposing them. And here we have Safiya radiallahu anha. She is describing the Prophet ﷺ with the highest and most honorable kind of morality. There is an incident that happened with uh, Safiya radiallahu anha. It's narrated authentically. That the Prophet came to Safiya, bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. And she belongs to the chain, uh, sorry, to, to the uh, uh, family tree or offspring or lineage of Harun, the brother of Musa. She belonged to the lineage of Harun, the brother of Musa. So as the Prophet entered uh, to Safiya, he saw her crying. So he said, what makes you cry, O oh, Safiya? She said, Hafsa, <clears throat> describe me that I am the daughter of a Jew. The Prophet said, you are the daughter of a prophet. I am, and I'm your uncle with regard to the family of prophethood. And you are under the supervision of a prophet. So why she is boasting against you? This, subhanAllah, this is the, what do you call that? The fast, the very fast, good hitting points of Rasulullah. That immediately the Prophet ﷺ reminded her about what? About her lineage. That Harun is your father. So how can he be a, a daughter of, of Judaism? No, no, no. You are the daughter of a Muslim prophet. And that is Harun. And the prophets are Muslims. And I wonder, some, some Muslims today don't understand that. They say, no, Musa was a Jew, you know, he was... Prophets of the Jews. No. Subhanallah. The Prophet said to his people, وَقَالَ مُوسَى يَا قَوْمِ إِن كُنْتُمْ آمَنْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ فَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُسْلِمِينَ Musa said to his people, Oh my people, if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then trust him if you are Muslims. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا التَّوْرَاةَ فِيهَا هُدًا وَنُورٍ we have revealed the Torah. In it, there is what? Guidance and light. يَحْكُمُ بِهَا النَّبِيُّونَ الَّذِينَ أَسْلَمُوا The prophets who are Muslims, they are judging it, the Torah. The prophets who are Muslims. So the Torah is for the Jewish prophets? Allah is saying, the Muslim prophets, they judge with the Torah. They judge by the Torah. Or they judge the Torah. So, all prophets are Muslims. In the deen and Allah, Islam. The religion with Allah is Islam. In a very significant short debate with Christians in the Hyde Park, I was asking a Christian, "Was Christ Christian?" He can't say Christ was Christian because he knows that the name, the word Christianity, came from Christ. He said, uh, I don't know. I said, how come you don't know? You should know. Was Christ Christian? Then afterwards he said, no, he was a Jew. I said, he was a Jew. Was Judah a Jew? Immediately I asked him this question. Was Judah a Jew? Uh, he's confused more. He couldn't answer that. I said, all right, what about his father, Abraham? Grandfather of, of Judah is Abraham. Was he Jew or Christian? Here comes the Quranic answer. مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ 
Ibrahim was neither Christian nor Jew. But he was Muslim Hanif. Hanif, yani inclining to Tawheed. Not only Muslim, the, yani he has two significant characteristics. His extreme submission, his extreme Tawheed. وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ So subhanAllah, then after that he said to Hafsa, Fear Allah, O Hafsa. He used to be alayhi salatu wasalam. We have five minutes, right? Yes. Four, five minutes. Four, five minutes. Yeah. He used to be supplicating Allah, Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi, when the Prophet sees himself, O oh Allah, as you well set my, my creation, make well or set well my morality. <clears throat> There's different, small difference between khalq and khuluq. See, they, they look alike, khalq, khuluq. The difference in the vowels only. While, while um, kha, la, qa of khuluq is the same of kha, la, qa, khalq. Only the vowels are different. So it's so close together. So the Prophet, as he's saying in his supplication, Oh Allah, as you well set my creation, so well set my morality. He's to be asking Allah. Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi fa ahsan khuluqi. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said a very beautiful word. He said, Jama'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bayna taqwa Allahi wa husni al-khuluq. The Prophet ﷺ combined between fearing Allah and good morality. فَتَقْوَ اللَّهِ أَوْجَبَتْ لَهُ مَحَبَّةُ اللَّهِ And the fearing of Allah made it, subhanAllah, necessarily, and it caused necessarily the loving of Allah to him. وَحُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ أَوْجَبَ لَهُ مَحَبَّةَ النَّاسِ And the good morality made him beloved necessarily by people. <laughs> There's a problem with us. Many of us, when they fear Allah, they have fear of Allah, but they don't have, they lack good morality. It's very rare that someone will be combining, collecting the two in one person, the two characteristics in one person. We should be struggling on that to improve ourselves. He was so soft and uh, very kind to his wives, to the extent that uh, in one of his travels, Aisha was young. So he said to his companions, go far, be distant a bit from me. So as they became distant from him, he said to Aisha, let's race. Aisha was so thin, skinny. So they raced. And Aisha radiallahu anha, hmm, she preceded him. <clears throat> I don't know if the Prophet did it purposely or not, but she won. She said after many years, when you know the, the, the flesh increased in me, he did the same, he ordered his companions to stay away, and then he raced with her, then he won against her. And he said, this is for that one before. <laughs> This is for that one. He used to be so kind with his wives. That's why والسلام, was really significant. <clears throat> the one who reads the stories of the Prophet والسلام, will be knowing for sure that this is not a scenario designed by someone. Can't be. Especially when you read Bukhari and Muslim, you see the details that no one can set them together like this. It's impossible. He will be concluding. That really, this man was really helped. Why they have to, why they have to ignore him and to fight the religion he came with? Why? Why they're complaining that uh, his religion is superseding, is going all into the all, uh, in, in all the world? They're complaining now. In you know, last year or two years before now, the French people they made a demonstration, protesting that the Islamic culture is super, superseding us. It's affecting our uh, culture. It's affecting our civilization. Oh, wait a minute. One century before, 
you have colonized the Muslim world. And you try to change their curriculums and the way of their culture. And now you are afraid that, it, that the Islamic uh, culture is superseding you and affecting you? Where is your campaigns against the Muslims? So it's, they can see that Islam is going everywhere, despite they can see that it's weak, but it's strong at the same time. That's why they have a sort of what they call it Islamophobia. It's weak, but it's conquering. It's the fastest growing religion now in the, in the United States. In, uh, in ABC News and many other American channels, they had confessed that there's a, 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 about uh, an average of 20,000 people in America. Every year they're, they're converting to Islam, despite all the political burdens. You know, the, politi the politicians, they know that if you want to be a uh, politician, you have to give, up, to give up morality. You have to be hypocrite. There's no way out but to do this. But despite all those political burdens, Islam is still going faster, despite all the stumbling blocks that they put against it, politically, economically, still going. Why do you have to fight him? Why? You, know, you are significant people, influential people, but what's going on with this Arabian man who used to be riding a camel now? You are struggling against his religion. You are struggling against the speed kind of growing of his You have to believe that the significance of this man is his prophethood, is the support of the creation, of, the creator of the world to him and to his religion. We continue, inshallah, next week uh, with the same topic. And we may start next week, inshallah, giving the merits of Abu Bakr and Umar and so on. I think for for halaqah now we have made uh, done three or four? Three. Three. Yeah, three. Okay. So this is the third one. We may need uh, a fourth one, and then inshallah we will start giving the merits of the Sahaba, starting with Abu Bakr and Umar, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khayran. That's enough. Do you got any question? Yeah. Just remind us about tomorrow's plan. Tomorrow, inshallah, there will be iftar. Uh, so please, you are requested. Uh, we'd like to, to have the honor and the reward from you by inviting you to the iftar, inshallah. So be with us. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. How about the lecture tomorrow is your door? Depending what time the... Yeah. It won't be as... I would suggest we leave it for the next week. If, if people are fasting, all fasting tomorrow. It can't be. Sure. Next, next I would prefer that tomorrow there's nothing. We, inshallah, we continue from next Saturday, Yeah, the message went out, but if you do, just do a short talk about the benefits and the merits of Arafah. Uh, short, short now? No, tomorrow. After inshallah, inshallah. Uh, well, just to, to encourage you, that the Prophet ﷺ said about fasting this day, that it expiates <clears throat> the last year and the current year. Until its end. The last year, as Sanat al Madia, as Sanat al Lahmas, as Sanat al Sabiqa, was Sanat al Madia, al Madia al Tamdi, yani, yani to, the, to the end of this year, you'll be granted forgiveness. So make sure that if, if you count your sins, uh, I think you find the need for fasting that day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Our good works and good deeds. Barakallah fikum, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, shalom, la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Ah, sanat, sorry, sorry, the hadith is as sanat al-madiyah wa sanat al-baqiyah. I'm sorry. Okay, barakallah fikum.